honor to welcome uh, uh, Professor Eve Riskin. Uh, welcome to Gotara's platform for Terra Talks. Very thrilled to have uh, to be doing the Terra Talk the week of uh, International Women's Day. I think it's a perfect uh, time to talk about the topic we're going to talk about today. Um, and obviously, Women's History Month as well, this uh, the month of uh, March. So, um, uh, what I want to start with is your STEM story, Eve. What inspired you to go into engineering and academia? I almost feel like engineering is one hurdle for a lot of women. Uh, very few women go into it. And then even fewer go to, into academia. So I really want to want you to share your story on how it, it happened and who helped shape that path for you. Okay, thank you. Um, again, thank you for inviting me, and I'm really happy to be here. And thank you for that really great, great question. Um, I would start by saying, if you talk to people my age, I, women my age, I think you will hear stories of accidental um, decision making, serendipity, um, not so well planned out. But I'm hopeful in what I see with younger women is there's a lot more thought that goes into their um, career paths and their decisions and I like I see that as a really good thing I see that as the stem fields are finally really opening up and um, you know welcoming women so that they can actually be thoughtful about their decisions so so my um, how I, I wound up in electrical engineering was as I just alluded to rather accidental I went to college my my dad used to um, introduce himself as one of the world's oldest computer nerds. So he was working on computers in the 50s. Um, and when my mom went back to work after being a housewife, which was what women did in the 60s and 70s, she had gotten a chemistry degree, but she taught herself how to program. So she became the Oracle lady at her work. And my brother and sister also, they're both older, had taught themselves how to program. So I went to college saying, I'm going to study computer science. It must be genetic. and. You know, at MIT, the computer science department is linked with electrical engineering as one big department. So regardless of which major you take, you have to take classes from both. And so uh, my second semester, sophomore year, I was taking a class in, which was the CS class, Digital Computer Organization, and I could not have cared less about the content. And at the same time, I was taking Signals and Systems, which was the double E class, and it had a lot of math. So I always loved math. I was good at math. It came easily to me. And I had no idea that engineers you know, did so much math. And I went to my computer science advisor said, I think I'm going to switch. And he said, oh, electrical engineering is only for very physical thinkers, which I'm totally not. But thankfully, I ignored him and switched. And so um, again, it was a, quite an accident. Um, and then the, the faculty I had who was teaching that class um, saw that I was doing well. And he said, you know, oh, you're doing well. Are you going to go to graduate school? And I said, am I going to do what? And he said, keep your grades up and you can go to graduate school. So again, I think most women my age have somebody that reached out who encouraged you. And it didn't have to be huge. Um, it could just be somebody saying, you know, I think you have what it takes. And so I'm very grateful to him. I followed his suggestions and, you know, wound up at, at Stanford where, boy, um, it was challenging. <laughs> um, it, I had no idea what graduate school was. I had no idea what qualifying exams were. I didn't know I wound up at a place where almost half of the people failed them. And so it was like this obsessive hurdle to get through. Um, and then the academic idea again came as a complete, again, serendipitous accident. I happened to go to a, a talk on young faculty saying that they, why they became faculty. And I said, oh, I'm going to do that. And I aimed really low. I said, I'm going to be a professor at San Jose State because, again, back in the day, um, you know, women weren't encouraged to talk about your strengths. Everybody assumed you were there because you were a girl, not even, you know, talking about overt, I'm quoting somebody. Um, and so I felt like it was really important not to um, talk big and to set myself up for low expectations. And then, as it turned out, I, you know, I wound up at a research one and it's been a wonderful career. So thank you wow. for the What a story. I just wanted to say a few things. First, your family of computer scientists and electrical engineers, uh, special kudos to your mom. In those days, after raising the kids, uh, she went back to school. She went back to school and she became a programmer. That's huge. 
actually she she had gotten her degree when she was in her early 20s she self-taught actually the all four of them were self-taught so i thought that was even probably more impressive but my mom is probably the smartest person i ever met but you know she's 80, almost 89 years old and so she was admitted to medical school at the university of louisville but instead got married because to my dad because she was 21 and was at you know big risk of being an old maid so that We've come a long way from that, thank goodness, because she would have been a fabulous doctor. Um, yeah. But, you know, it That's was awesome. just, you didn't um, do uh, that. Yeah. I just wanted to interrupt for a second. Yadu, is there a problem? You raised your hand. Yes, no? Okay, I'm assuming no. Okay, uh, the second observation that I made as you were answering the question was, um, they, uh, one of your professors said it requires physical thinking to be an electrical engineer what does that mean i don't know i th i think he meant you had to be good at physics um and i didn't love physics ah um, I, but, see, I see yeah Got what's it. nice about electrical engineer is engineering we are such a broad field that we have in my department faculty are computer scientists um, biologists physicists material scientists and mathematicians so uh -huh. and electrical engineers so it's a really broad field and you can you know narrow down and find the part that works for you um, yeah. But that's what I think he was, you know, this was the early 80s, so we'll, we'll give the guy a break. Um, yeah, yeah. And then you went to graduate school. That was just awesome. So were you the first one in the family to go to graduate school? Yes, I, I was the first. My brother and sister later both went and got Masters of Social Work degrees, and so they're all therapists now. I don't know if that's a result of having worked in the computer industry. Um, but they're very good um, kind of trauma therapists, but I'm the only one who went and got a PhD. Oh, congratulations. You're a trailblazer. That's awesome. <laughs> so, if I may introduce, this is Bluey, um, the cat, and she's a girl, so it, it's okay that she's here for a woman. <laughs> so um, so t tell us a little bit about uh, your program that you drive at the University of Washington here in Seattle on diversity and why are you passionate about that? Okay, so um, actually I, I lead two quite different programs. Um, one is called Advance, which is for women faculty in science and engineering. And the other is called STARS, which is for students from first generation college backgrounds and, and students who come from low income families and from high schools that have high populations of the students on free and reduced price lunch. Um, and so I am very passionate, and I can tell you more about them, but I'm really passionate about these programs because um, academia has traditionally been a patriarchy, probably a white patriarchy, where those who are not inside the system see it as this huge mystery. Um, and you think the system is 100% correct. And if you have any challenges, it must be yourself. Mm -hmm. And I very badly experienced long periods of doubt from really small slights because I had no idea that perhaps that professor who said that wasn't the be all and end all. And so I think those of us who have managed to claw our way through the system and succeed, I feel like it's really important to try A, to warn the system while you're there, but also to help demystify it for the people who come after us because we lose so much talent from people who don't feel welcome. And the research shows that women leave engineering because they don't have the sense of belonging that people need. Yeah. Um, and you know, when I talk to groups of young women, they always talk about having the imposter syndrome. And you know, I like to flip it around and say, it's actually the system is the problem. It's not you. You are very talented. You are bright. You belong to be here. But the system wasn't designed with you in mind, and it can be very uncomfortable. So yeah. I, I think it's, I get a lot of joy out of seeing people succeed. One of my mentees from, um, she was an undergrad here, just got tenure at the University of Texas at Austin while having two babies in a pandemic. And, you know, it's just such a thrill to see somebody, and she is extremely talented. I, you know, I can't take the credit, but I, I get a lot of joy out of seeing her. Yeah. You realize her. These are really, really awesome two programs that you are involved in and leading. And you put the nail in the head on the two areas 
for students where they're low income or first generation, those are the ones who struggle. They don't have any role model. They don't have any network like some of the privileged people do. And the second one is equally important to me is the faculty. What I realized as I started interacting, at first I thought, well, academia is more liberal and it probably is better than corporate. And as I started getting into academia, I realized that we are probably not in as good shape as I thought. And faculty is actually in the worse shape than students. So a lot of universities are doing a great job of uh, uh, recruiting them in now. And they're making lots of efforts. Almost every university has some sort of a program going on. None of them have a program for faculty. How do you take a woman that comes in, joins as an associate professor to get on a tenure track? And that's a very, very, very important part that we need to figure out how to do. And in, on Gotara platform, we actually talk about this, whether you're in academia or you are in um, corporations. We say that we got to help you figure out how to how to leverage the current system to spiral up. Once you spiral up, you can go change the rules. You'll have the authority and the power to change the rules. You can say the rules are unfair today, which they absolutely are in some cases, but you don't, you're not in the, you don't have the power to change them. Exactly. And, and, and so, so I think the things that you're doing, um, I would love to figure out how we collaborate on this topic because it is so close to my heart. You just said a few things about academia and I want to help, but I don't know how because academic institutions move so slow, even though they know that this is a problem, they know that this needs to get fixed. So we need to figure out, I, I don't know if you have any pointers on how to accelerate that thought process. Well, in, in fact, um, it, some very good news is that the National Science Foundation, which is you know the federal entity that funds science and technology, engineering, math, research, you know a huge amount of it that's not biomedical, um, started a program in 2001, which is the advanced program, um, and they make large grants to individual universities to look at the policies, procedures, and practices that were holding women, faculty, and STEM back. And the University of Washington, we got one of the very first grants, again, mm -hmm. over 20 years ago. And so we've been doing this work ever since. That's what I, that's the program that so I do. So has the statistics, practices. so has the statistics at University of Washington changed? Very much so. We've more than doubled the number of women faculty in the 19 science and engineering departments we cover. We've increased the percentage of women faculty in the University of Washington College of Engineering from about 14% to 26%. Um, and I never had a woman professor in 10 years of higher ed other than Spanish, French, and music. Um, but now when you have one in four of your faculty being a woman, it's normalized for students to have women faculty. And then that has, you know, obviously that's an, a strength for the young women, but it's also really important for the young men. So, so yeah. and, and, the, and these programs are all over the country. And so we really have made strides. You are totally right that academia runs very slowly. And, uh, you know, it's like an enormous shift to turn it one degree to the right. Yeah. Um, so in corporation, we are 27% today. We're likely oh. to be 50%. And uh, and I'm glad to hear that your university went from 14 percent to 26, 27 percent. And how can we kind of bring all the institutions and organizations together to 50 percent? Right. It needs to be <laughs> or close to 50 percent. So and, and that's kind of the education and the work on the ground with with the key players. And what's wonderful is that the leaders here at UW have totally bought into what we're saying. And in part is if you have resources, that's helpful. But we also approach leaders with, we want to help you do your jobs better. And because, you know, leaders work with people, engineers, people, that's not necessarily what is covered in the curriculum. So we work with, with the leaders, help them work with their faculty, whether regardless of gender. And then we kind of, you know, send, kind of infiltrate our message and they've actually been extremely receptive. So it's been quite terrific for me again, to see in 20 years, how differently my own department reacts to hiring. It's so different yeah. um, and I'm really That's gratified. Really
That's awesome. Congratulations. So what opportunities and challenges do you see for women in academia in general? Not just you doubt, but academia. Okay, so certainly, again, the um, the world is changing. It used to have to be that the women had to be significantly better to be seen as equal. That's the um, implicit bias. Um, and so that's a huge opportunity. However, there is always some pushback. Change is hard, good even good change is hard. And so um, there was recently a tweet in January from a, a retired faculty here who misinterpreted some research out of Cornell um, and it had a big you know blow up on Twitter and uh, yeah. still going on and so it's it's like fake news one bad study or one misinterpretation if somebody has 50,000 Twitter Twitter followers it gets out in the ether and then people say things to women like well clearly it must be easy for you because you're a woman or to an African-American woman you must have lots of opportunities and they're neglecting the racism and sexism that she had faced for years. So that, so yes, it's wonderful that people are more open and welcoming and it's important that people uh, you know, don't have their accomplishments diluted just because people think that the attributes of the person are more important than their actual skills. Yeah. So, so um, um, my next question for you is, and if there are any questions from, from the audience, please raise your hand. I'll make sure that I ask um, Eve. Um, so my next question to you is, um, how have you na navigated your own career to overcome some of the hurdles that you just mentioned? Can you give a couple of examples? We learn better from examples. So if you can give us some examples, we can go apply it. <laughs> okay, so I came up with the word venture, and it's a cross between the word mentor and vent. And so everybody needs a venture, and a venture is a close friend where something bad happens to you, and you go into their office, and you close the door, and you say, right now, I hate everyone in the world except you and me. And you tell them what, just what offensive request, comment, whatever just came into your inbox or in person, you process it, you vent, and then you can go out and deal with it in a more professional manner. So I have a couple of very important venters um, and we're very supportive and we show up for each other. Um, so that has been really helpful. I also like to use my sense of humor, um, which I, I like to think I have one, um, but I will try if to use humor to get messages across. Um, so for example, this was extremely rare, but a few years ago, twice in one week, a man had suggested an idea and it was attributed to a woman. And I, you know, which is exceedingly rare. And so I said, you know, yes, um, that was Dan's idea, but it sounds really much better when Joyce said it. And, you know, and my point was, is I was highlighting the fact that normally it goes the other way. And so so, so if you can use humor, it can help disarm people and you can get your message across in a less threatening way. Um, and then sometimes you have to go non-linear. If bad things are happening to you, then you need to marshal your resources and figure out what is fair and what is not fair. And if it's not fair, then you need to go and um, ask for what you deserve. Because if you don't ask, the answer is no. And honestly, people are not looking out for you as much as you would like them to. People are working too hard, you know, businesses or you know, universities are overstaffed. So just because somebody doesn't offer you something or a raise or an X or Y, it isn't that you don't deserve it. It could just be that they forgot. And so, so I like to say, you have to be your own best self-advocate. And as you said, Sangeeta, it's important when you're junior to color in the lines, play in the system, and then when you succeed, then you can change the system. Yeah, so that, absolutely right. I love the word venta. Oh, thank you. Awesome. It me. <laughs> this, is, this is just great because that's what actually, that is a behavior, you can coin this term, this is the behavior that we see on our platform when women, not all the time, but some of the times when they are angry about something that has happened and they're asking for help. So they're not only able to vent, 
but they are able to also ask like how do i handle the situation so it's a perfect place for go, uh, for them to come to gotara sometimes you don't have a person you can go vent to in the virtual world sometimes you can go to somebody in person but you can come to gotara platform and actually do your ventilating <laughs> <laughs> so I really like that word and and I like your um, comment about humor. Uh I I like the fact that you said, you know, I liked it better when Joy said it. Yeah. Because this happens all the time. Dan, your idea is always picked up but as Joy still say the same thing, never picks up. Right. Uh, <laughs> so Um, our CEO, COO Dana again does a great job of uh, leveraging humor when she actually provides advice. Like use humor, and sometimes it goes over much easier for people to take. I I agree. Right. Yeah, yeah. So um, it, it, now I have a very broad question. In your opinion, what will it take to close the gender gap in academia? I mean, the reason I'm asking this question is not just for the audience. I want to figure out how to help also from Gotara perspective. So that's a really yes you're right that's a broad question. Um I think it would be important for people to stop uh, assuming or presuming what other people are thinking. So there's a different pro, uh, lecture or sorry faculty here who maybe 5 years ago wrote an article why women don't code. He's a man. So <laughs> you know so don't speak for other people don't assume what women want or don't want assume that everybody might want the same thing um and then figure out what is it that are holding back different groups of people whether it's you know sexism racism ableism you know homophobia um and if you look at your system and figure find the um you know the toxicity in it and work to detox it it's good for those groups you know people from marginalized groups but it's also really good for straight white heteronormative men because nobody likes to be around you know it's really painful to watch people being you know devalued it's demoralizing exactly. um so it's really good for morale when everybody is welcome and happy and can do their best work i'm um, yeah. thinking how much time you all spend on hr right human resources dealing with people who aren't performing well or people who are being targeted if everybody would just step back and recognize you're all in the same team you need the safety and the space to do your best work i think it could go far so as far as gender gaps i mean i think you know people are it's it's a slow process as you point as you pointed out but every you know treat each person sometimes the work is one person at a time retaining a female professor is one person and with our stars program which is again students from low income backgrounds we've had it'll be over 9 years we have 300 students that's not a huge number and my colleague Sonia Cunningham says this work is one student at a time so if at the end of the day you help somebody stay that's valuable um and you should recognize that and in companies and universities should also value that work yeah. so that was a broad answer to a broad question Yeah, I know a lot of things you said were very very important and and I truly truly in fact I answered the question kind of the same way where they uh in one of the podcast um the host asked me about um what would be your advice today for the employers and for the individual and I kind of gave the same advice you just giving here is don't make assumptions and I'm telling employers not to make assumptions that Oh, Eve is young and she has a, a little daughter who's five years old. She probably doesn't want to travel, so this job is probably not for her. Let her decide. Maybe she has all kinds of help that she can use, and you don't need to worry about that. And on the other hand, for the individual women to assume that somebody is discriminating against them because I asked for this and I didn't hear the right words, sometimes the intentions are not. uh what you think they are you should just ask sometimes people just don't do it with bad intentions they just don't know and and so i think if we could work both ways and not making assumptions i think we could do a better job as as a ecosystem 
I like that. I totally agree with you. Sometimes you know, people just say the wrong thing and um, and we don't need to write them off as the lost exactly. cause and cancel yeah. them, right? The cancel yeah. culture at That's the right. end of the day, um, I don't think is that useful. So yeah. I think we yeah. should give people grace, assume they're coming with good intentions, like you said, and talk about it. If something offended you, give them the opportunity yeah. to explain their thinking and perhaps it's a teachable moment for everybody. Yeah. So. So one last question before we close, what would be your last advice to the audience, whether they pursue corporate uh, career or academic career? Uh, yeah, that I, and I, I don't know that I have good advice because I've never been in a corporate situation. So okay. I might have to have somebody else tell me, but I can speak for academia. I love the freedom. I love that I get to do what I love to do. I love that direct impact on students and colleagues. Um, I love being around young people and, you know, I'm not young, that's for sure, but being around, you know, people in their early twenties, it, it helps make me feel more young than I am. Um, and I, you know, we get to learn, we get to do what we want. So I think it's been a great place for me. I think corporate, uh, you know, perhaps you have better boundaries. Perhaps you have more weekends than I have. I have weekends now. I didn't used to when my kids were young. Um, so, you know, there's pluses and minuses, but I, I yeah. do think the independence is a huge um, plus of academia. academia. Yeah, so. that, that, that is very, very true. Um, I think uh, the independence of doing stuff that you want to do um, is, is, is critical and being around young people. Every time I visit a university for one reason or another, I feel young already, so <laughs> so that's definitely a plus. And I know why people, uh, once they go into academia, they love it and they couldn't be anywhere else. So so thank you. Uh, I, we, are, we are up on our time, but uh, thank you, Professor E. Riskin. You've been awesome. I think your advice from start to finish is so point on. Um, so thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And, um, and I also want to thank the audience uh, for joining us. And, uh, and if you're not already a member, join Gotara and get some help from people like uh, Eve, you know. And as she also said, spiral up and change the rules as necessary. So thank, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, this was a great conversation. A conversation. So thank you, everybody. Until next time. Talk to you later. Mm-hmm.